Hi, my name is Nicholas Sharashidze and I'm a 20-year-old economics student at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, today I wish to talk about several things. And first of all, involving my family name as they were the princes of Apasia. And second of all, talking about my academic successes at the University of Texas at Austin and my passion for economics. Firstly, I will talk about economics. Now, economics is a subject matter that I'm deeply passionate in because I used to read about it through Adam Smith. He was a very inspiring author to me and I would say one of the greatest founders of modern day economics. The reason why I'm so passionate about it and why I'm studying at the University of Texas at Austin is because, first of all, aside from the fact that Austin is a very huge economic capital of the world, and but what I mean by that is it is a center of trade, a center of culture, and a very important part of the United States and North America specifically. And the reason why I'm studying at the University of Texas at Austin, besides the fact that it is in Austin, is because I find the university to be quite interesting and inspiring. Every day I wake up, I get to see very interesting architectural monuments. I get to see the founding fathers of many fields of science, and aside from science, even politics. And I'm very interested in those matters. Now, the reason why I went off to study there, aside from all of those things, again, is because I'm also interested in economics, once again. And studying there has deepened my passion to a much more deeper extent. First of all, this semester I took the classes of microeconomics, AI, computer science, several other languages, and I was very interested in finding out more. Aside from studying economics and finding out more about average variable costs, average total costs, and other concepts related to those, I also studied Python, which is a programming language in computer science. And what I found very interesting was that my classes were really coinciding with each other. With each other. We, aside from studying AI, it coincided with economics because I used to find out how AI can be used to finance and get interested and involved in many concepts that are related to hedge funds and other investment concepts. And aside from that, my CS class taught me how to create those AI programs. Now, beyond those matters, what I am most passionate about studying in the United States is that I'm currently the only, as far as I know, I was told this, I didn't know for certain, I'm the currently the only occasion that is studying at such a high level of a university. And though I'm proud and I'm very happy about it, it I see it more as a responsibility. As a Sharashiza and as a descendant of Prince Aslan Bey of Apasia, I view, it as, I view it as a big responsibility for me to uphold myself to higher standards, to study well, to be motivated to do more, to find out more about the world. And what I found most interesting about studying at this university is the more I learn, the more I know that I don't know more, and which inspires me to find out more about the world. What I would say is a very interesting thing that happens when you study is, aside from the fact that you become more knowledgeable about, about certain concepts and topics, you find out that there is so much to the world that you don't know yet, but you can still find out about. And that is very inspiring to me. So even though I wish to talk about history, the history of Apasia is as long as I I can't even talk about how long it is, it is very long. So what I would do instead of that is focus on the most important parts of Apasian history. And to me, those most important parts involve the first few centuries of AD, which particularly means from 300 to 900 AD, and then the like, just is the kingdom period. And then I would talk about, to me, which is the most, I would say, fundamental part of Apasian history, the principality history, which involved my family members, the Shah Rashidzes. And then I'll talk about modern day history in a little bit. So the first few centuries, I would say the first few centuries of Apasia were quite intricate and interesting as it's a very ancient place. It's, I, I can't even describe how important it is in world affairs. The mention of Apasia is very interesting. The city of Dioscorius, which is refle reflecting upon the history of ancient Greece itself, it's a coinciding history of the Western world. And the city of Dioscorius is very interesting to me because it is, it was and by legend, it was uh, made by Castor and Pollux, who are two Greek deities. And it is, I would say, aside from being a port and a big merchant location and a big, big metropolitan capital of the world in the past, it was also a big part of Western history itself. Dioscorius and the Dioscori brothers are a very important two deities who are even shown in the Roman pantheons and I would say in most Greek architecture itself. And so that is what I found really interesting is the intricate way in which it connects with merchants, the seafare and travel and the architecture there, which I think could be unearthed and could be talked about and I see a lot of potential in is inspiring to me. I would say the most we can find out about the ancient history of Apasia would be through finding out more about 
the world in, in itself at that time through other contemporary sources, but at the same time through archaeological excavations. I would say the city of Dioscorius shows great promises, and looking at it and finding out more about it will not only bring more international attention to the world, but maybe through viewing of those locations, as they were very prominent locations, keep that in mind, we can find out more about the ancient Roman world, the ancient Greek world, and maybe even other nations that are no nearby. So from 10th to the 19th century, the family of the Sharvashidze were the princes of Abkhazia, and they're ruling it quite interestingly. I would say the reason why I find my familiar history so interesting and the history of Abkhazia so interesting is because and the dynasty itself of the Sharvashidze Sijay Chachpas, as some of you may know, is because it addresses certain topics that I find particularly interesting. Number one, the family never ruled with power, and as in power of armies or power of threats. It was the only dynasty, as far as I know, which ruled through pure respect and authority. And what I mean by that is the family was, first of all, qualified and educated well enough and respected well enough to rule and that's where they got the authority from it never came from some sort of like threats or anything such as that and that is why it's really unique when we read about ancient antique sources about the one of the founders of the family such as Darden Charashiza who was a prominent member of the family who fought in the battle of Kosadag with the uh, sultans of Rum we find out more about him and we know that he was a very well a respected soldier and aside from that a benevolent a very respected ruler and what is so interesting to me is not the sources that are near the Caucasus itself but foreign sources such as from the Ottoman Empire sources from ancient principalities that were nearby and sources from under contemporary authors really do talk about the rulers of the family another very interesting uh, member of the family out to, in my opinion at least is Solomon Sharvashidze who was the Prince of Apasia in the 15th century. Now, the reason why I find him particularly interesting is because, first of all, aside from the fact that his name was Solomon, and that is a very Christian and very ancient name, he was a very interesting, prominent, respected, and I would say a big patriot of the nation and of the region of the Caucasus. He was a very westernized man. He would support a number of causes. He would finance Christian churches. He would support local groups. And as far as I know, he was very um, close to the Byzantine Empire at the time. And because of he was so close to the Byzantine Empire, as some of you may know, in the 1453, the Byzantine Empire fell. And so what he had to do at that time was follow a crisis of several nations collapsing. Now, when we talk about big nations, and I mean truly big nations, such as the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, like uh, the Holy Roman Empire even, or like nations such as the United Kingdom, the United States, or any of those nations, if those nations, by a tragedy, suffer from something that is, in, like, I would say, very prominent, that gives a ripple effect to other nations. And what happened with the collapse of the Byzantine Empire was a ripple effect throughout all of Christendom. We see the effects of the collapse of the Byzantine Empire in England. We see the collapse of the Byzantine Empire's effects in all of Europe, and we most prominently see it in the Caucasus because what happened during that time was a lot of local princes had to focus on creating a specific, not only an economic, but a big background that would support local communities. And what happened with Solomon was he promoted Christianity, he strengthened the local navy, and I would say even at the time, he was in, I, as, as far as I know, as, as far as I know from local history and from contemporary sources, he was close to Genoese merchants and at that time, we had a very close relations with several uh, Western countries. Now, Italy at the time was, of course, separated into multiple kingdoms and duchies. Uh, as far as I know, there were several duchies. There was the Duchy of, as I believe, Milan. Although the, the term of duchy and kingdoms change a lot throughout the history of the time, because um, as far as I know, the rulers of specific kingdoms and duchies at the time would exchange titles. They would either become kingdoms or they would become duchies. But aside from that point, Italy was not united. And the fact that a very distant but a prominent prince was able to establish a big community in the Caucasus and a very big communication with merchants just goes to show you how prominent of an individual he was for the 15th century. And 15th century is a time where there's downtrodden collapse of everything from the Byzantine Empire to 
attacks to global world supply shortages. It was a very interesting time, but for a local prince of the Caucasus to somehow unite people and like be a big part of the community, that is a very big accomplishment. Now, I talked about the 12th century, the 10th century, and the 15th century, but now I'll move on to talk about the 19th century, which is really interesting to me. Now, during the 19th century, there were a lot of, um, I would say, sovereign princes of Apesia, such as Aslan Bey, who I'm descended from, Kelish Bey, Sefer Bey, and others. Kelish Bey being the most prominent, and Aslan being the, the continuator of the prominence. I would say Kelish Bey was an interesting figure, in my opinion, because during the 18th to 19th centuries, he was a very skilled individual. He was able to take the Western cock, like, Aside from Apasia, he was able to take, and what I find really inspiring was he would unite the Caucasus in itself in a specific matter, in a specific cause, and he was a very prominent individual. He would be in communication with, Ottoman, with the Ottoman Empire. He was in communications with Napoleon Bonaparte, which is really interesting to me because no one talks about that. He was in communications with Napoleon Bonaparte, and that just signifies how important he was as an individual. Now, I would say... The reason why I find the history of Apesia and the Caucasus so interesting is because it's not only a history of people, but it's a history of individuals and how they come up against the struggle of against a bigger enemy, against a bigger cause, and how they unite people in a specific environment. And Kelish Bey was that individual. He was an individual who was skilled at navy tactics. He was skilled at warfare. He was skilled as an economics individual, as an economics. Um, individual, a passionate individual regarding that matter. And at the same time, he was, I, I believe, as much as I could know, a fan of history. Because at the time, what I found was a lot of members of our family had artifacts from the ancient Roman Empire, which is really interesting, which could imply to a certain extent that our family could trace its roots to the kingdom of Asia, which I don't find surprising at all. I believe that our family, by blood, is descended from uh, local lords, local princes. But aside from that matter, what I would say was really interesting to me is how he was seeing the the Caucasian cause, the Caucasian cause and the Western cause of the region and going up against natural attacks from different enemies. He was a very interesting individual and a source of great inspiration to me. Now regarding Aslan Bey, Aslan Bey was the second side of that coin and I would say the continuator of the cause. First of all, Aslan means, as far as I know, lion in Proto-Turkish. And he was, by all means, as, as much of a lion as Richard the Lionheart. He was a great individual. He was a great seafarer as his father, a great, um, I would say, ambitious, very motivated individual, which I find quite inspiring. When we look at history, a lot of people forget that these individuals were actually, what they were was individuals. They were not like gods or something of deities we forget that people have weaknesses people feel things but what i see when i look at his history is any type of difficulty that he would face any sort of challenge that he would face he would go up against it and crush it that was his passion and i'm truly inspired by him and as his descendant i'm greatly honored to be his descendant but once again though i feel honored to be his descendant I would say there are a lot of members of our family who are princes, and they feel it's the same honor. But to me, what I find interesting about the whole history is I am inspired by it to do more. I study at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm a great academic. I'm inspired by economics, and I pursue my passions very deeply. I, in fact, I'm a parliamentarian in my student government, and I'm the officer in the biggest international community at the University of Texas at Austin. And so... Every day that I wake up, once again, I feel great inspiration from my ancestors, but at the same time, I feel like I must do more. Every day that I wake up, I must do more. I must learn more. I must contribute more to the world at large. And what I find interesting is I see myself not as a, um, not labeled in a specific matter, but I see myself as a man of the Caucasus. And that is a very unique thing. Being a Caucasian and being, feeling this inspiration from those sources is very inspiring to me seeing this great big big region as big as out not as big but culturally as big as europe is very interesting to me the caucasus has a very interesting history though the many sources that we have have not been written the contemporary authors talk a great deal about the local culture the many things that we could contribute to society with and, and many things we could do for society in general and i feel like had we been through a different type of 
environment more forgiving i would say because the environment that the caucasus was placed in was surrounded by giant empires and the fact that we survived is a is a very interesting piece of history that and one that should be talked about i would say would have contributed more to the world history at large because looking at ancient history and looking at the history of the family of the Sharashidza, we see a lot of patterns of communications with great empires communications and understandings of world politics and the understanding of the contribution that one must have to the world at large in history. And so now I must move on to 19th century and to George, the son of Dimitri Sharashidza, who was a great individual. Now, uh, my family members have suffered greatly under the previous regimes of the world. And as of now, and because of George Dimitri Sharashidza, who was a distant family member of ours and who would help my great grandfather through many means, he actually gave us several gifts that we still have to this day. And one of these gifts is his own personal pen that I still carry around with me. Though it is a great historical artifact, I still have it with me as a source of inspiration. It is a NML pen and it has great intricate decorations. And it's a classic dip fountain pen. You would dip it and you would write with it. And it just speaks to me as to how uh, significant local history was. The artifact itself is beautiful, it's gorgeous. And it's, it seems really interesting to me because I would say the modern day sword is not like a button or like a keyboard, but a pen. The things you can do with a pen and the things you can accomplish with conversations is unimaginable. I would say even, I would say the world's history can be dialed down to groups conversing. That is the world's history at large because through conversation and through engagement, what happens with the world is everything changes. Uh, just as a, as a joke, I would say the number of treaties that have been signed in Paris is absurd, but it just goes to show you the number of things that have been accomplished there. Now, Paris is like a very big metropolitan city. Nowadays, it's not as prominent as it used to be because most of the cities have shifted to places such as Austin, Dallas, Houston.